Hello YouTube, Dave here again. Welcome to part two of my fifth edition Dungeons & Dragons Buyer's Guide. Uh, this is uh, the video that's actually going to conclude my D&D Buyer's Guide series. It started uh, discussing everything from Zero Edition all the way up to the currently released products for fifth edition Dungeons & Dragons. Or at least what was currently released at the times of the recordings. Um, so today's this video is going to focus all on the published adventure books that have been released, or published adventures that have been released by Wizards of the Coast for 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. So everything from the starter set up to the Tomb of Annihilation. Uh, now, because um, there's only nine separate adventure books to discuss, uh, I'm going to be talking about all of them and not just the ones that I think are the most valuable for your dollar. I'm also going to be putting these in order of my personal preference from the one that I want to run the least uh, at this point in time to the adventures that I'm looking most forward to running at some point in the future. Uh, now that said, it's basically pure personal preference and everybody's list is going to be different. So anyone who wants to rank these adventures is going to come up with a different order. Just because your favorite adventure may be lower in the list doesn't mean that it's not good. Each of these adventures has something to offer to uh, a wide variety of groups and I don't think any of them are necessarily bad. Uh, even the one that's my least preferred to run has a lot of uh, good redeeming qualities about it that a particular group may be looking for. Uh, so I'm going to discuss basically uh, a brief summary of what happens in the adventure, uh, some of the positives and negatives of the adventure, and I'm going to end it by saying what type of dungeon master is best suited to run that adventure. So I'm going to categorize dungeon masters in a few different ways. There's the first ranking is going to be novice DMs. So novice dungeon masters are dungeon masters who are probably running their first adventures. So the adventures that are best for them are going to be ones that are a little bit more simplistic or linear uh, just to get them started. Uh, so these would be DMs with little to no experience. Uh, up next would be intermediate DMs as the second category. And for intermediate DMs, these are probably dungeon masters that have been running for uh, at least a year or so. So they're getting more comfortable, they're getting more familiar with the idea of running Dungeons & Dragons games. But for the most part, uh, an intermediate DM is probably going to be one who has started with 5th edition, uh, or maybe even a little bit of experience with 4th edition, but likely not much beyond that. So we're looking at dungeon masters with limited experience, but they've got at least you know a year or so of DMing under their belt. Uh, up next are going to be uh, veteran gamers, uh, or veteran dungeon masters, so that's our third category. And veteran dungeon masters are dungeon masters who have been running games for an extended period of time, likely spanning over multiple editions. Um, now these don't necessarily mean that you're the best dungeon masters, but a veteran dungeon master is somebody who's been doing it for a while. And a lot of times you guys, I mean, any, any DM is going to get good the more that they you know, have practice and the more that they do it. Uh, I've been running dungeon, Dungeons and Dragons games since 1999. So, um, you know, and that's going from second edition all the way up to current. Um, so I've got a lot of years of experience. I consider myself to be a veteran DM. Don't know if I consider myself to be an awesome DM or not. I don't really think that highly of myself, but uh, I do have a lot of experience. So I'm more comfortable running the most complex adventures that Wizards of the Coast has been putting out for the fifth edition game. And then finally, a fourth category is uh, a category of, of adventure that's perfect for all groups. So there's not very many of those, but there are at least one or two possibly that uh, would work for DMs of any skill level. So again, I'm going to start uh, start the video talking about you know my least preferred adventure in terms of how much I want to run it, up to my most preferred. And uh, again, it's just personal preference. Um, I was going to do that as a separate video, but I figured since we're going to be talking about all the adventures anyway, I may as well combine the two ideas. So, uh, again, all these adventures are perfect for particular groups, and all of them have good things to offer, and I don't think you're necessarily going to go wrong with any of these. So, without further ado, let's discuss the adventures themselves. Alright, so up first, we have the first of the hardcover D&D uh, &D 5th Edition adventures to be released. Uh, so at the bottom of my list is Horde of the Dragon Queen. Uh, the basic premise of Horde of the Dragon Queen is that the Cult of the Dragon is looking to uh, basically become a major player in Faerun. 
Uh, new leadership has taken over and they've abandoned the idea of Dracoliches bringing about this uh, doom doomsday prophecy that they've been uh, so obsessed with for, for years and years and, and even centuries. Uh, so they come up with a new idea that involves living dragons. Uh, Horde of the Dragon Queen basically involves the player characters discovering the Call to the Dragon's activities, and while they're, uh, the Call to the Dragon is trying to gather large uh, amounts of treasure for a horde in order to uh, secure the aid of, of dragons. Uh, towards the end, they also learn that the goal of the Cult of the Dragon is to actually summon Tiamat uh, from her prison in the Abyss to the Material Plane. Uh, so the adventure begins with the player characters discovering a town being attacked uh, by the Cult of the Dragon, uh, their mercenaries that they've hired, as well as a large blue dragon. They come to the town's aid, and then they basically follow the treasure from there. Uh, as they try to uncover the cult's uh, schemes. So this is a decent adventure, but uh, some of its negatives is that it is uh, quite linear. And uh, especially the early chapters just involves uh, things where it's just assumed that the player characters are going to do them. Uh, one of my biggest problems is that after the attack on the town of Greenest, is that the uh, player characters are asked to infiltrate the cult, to, the, you know, the cult of the dragon to find out what they're doing. And uh, the most logical way to do so would involve attacking a group of cult members and uh, you know, stealing their clothes and posing as them. And this is difficult because the adventurer actually actively tries to dissuade DMs from letting their players do that. So it takes one of the most obvious ways to infiltrate the cult and it kind of ruins it and makes it difficult. So there's got to be some judgment calls in there. And uh, again, it's just very linear. I don't know how many first, like more experienced first level characters would want to run towards a town being attacked by a huge blue dragon, <coughs> considering that that is, you know, pretty much uh, guaranteed death. So uh, while the attack on Greenus is cool, uh, it just doesn't work well the way that they present it. So there's going to be some things that you're going to want to change, or again, if you're a newer DM, then you know running the adventure as is uh, is a good way to kind of get familiar with running games. And it does start to open up towards the end. One of the chapters that I actually really like is a like two month long uh, journey from like the green fields up to like Waterdeep, I think it is. Uh, you know, with these cult members, the player characters are supposed to be like secretly following them and. Uh, so that actually gets you know kind of interesting, and it's, it's more built around role playing. So there are some good issues, uh, or, not, or not good issues. There's some good chapters in there, but the beginning is kind of linear and doesn't necessarily make the most logical sense. So from that perspective, this is kind of at the bottom of my list. Uh, now this adventure is great for beginning DMs uh, because of its early linearity, uh, you know, and it does start to expand on options as it goes. So if you're new to Dungeons and Dragons and you haven't run any adventures yet for fifth edition, uh, this one would be a good one to pick up. It's also a cheaper adventure than pretty much all the rest. Uh, this runs from levels one through seven. Uh, it is worth noting, however, that it is part of a two-part adventure, and the second book uh, will be featured later on in this video. But uh, for part one, uh, this is a cheaper alternative to some of the other adventures that are out there, and is great for uh, novice dungeon masters. So that's my recommendation for them. All right, uh, up next, the next adventure I want to talk about is Princes of the Apocalypse. So this is a update or modern uh, twist on the Temple of Elemental Evil uh, adventure from way back in 2nd edition Dungeons and Dragons. So this kind of takes that idea and introduces it in a new way. Uh, so the four elemental cults have invaded Faerun as they work for the Elder Elemental Eye. The player characters stumble upon uh, these cults and uh, basically subsequently deal with them as the adventure goes on. Uh, they eventually find their way to the main uh, strongholds of each of these uh, elemental cults and at the very end of the adventure are going to end up having to face off against one of the four possible uh, elemental princes. So, uh, the reason that this is kind of down low on the list, uh, this is, in my opinion, a great adventure, uh, but the problem comes from the fact that it feels like you're um, kind of doing the same thing over and over and over again. This is a dungeon crawl heavy 
campaign and this goes from levels 1 through 15 so there's a lot of dungeon crawling involved so it may feel a little bit tedious at times uh, you're also dealing sort of with the cults and um, you know each time you deal with a cult another one uh, essentially springs up where you have to start dealing with another one and uh, it's it just something that again could feel a little bit tedious over time uh, the main reason though that it's so low because I you know I don't mind the idea of you know a massive series of dungeon crawls uh, I think you'd be you know a lot of fun and I actually like the cults themselves and the cults even interact with one another so some cults try to turn the player characters against you know their rivals and stuff like that which I think is kind of neat uh, but the uh, the issues really come in that the conclusion of the campaign just doesn't necessarily feel that epic. And uh, that's more of a personal issue than probably uh, a practical one. Uh, but considering the adventure that came before this, facing off against one of the elemental princes, again, just feels like a bit of a letdown. Uh, the challenge level of each of the elemental princes is only about one to three levels, I think, above the player characters by the time they reach them. So it just doesn't feel like as climactic uh, an ending. And for me, that kind of goes a long way towards um, how much I want to run the adventure, because for me, the payoff is something that is a significant part. Uh, so I like the idea of the player characters doing something that really feels like it's, you know, earth-saving by the time they're, you know, at the end of this, you know, long campaign. Especially for all the dungeon crawling, it would have been nice to have had sort of a bigger payoff. My recommendation is to try to have a way for the player characters to encounter at least a couple of the elemental princes. Um, you know, uh, but maybe give the, the opportunity to get a, you know, a round or two in on one of them as it's being summoned and the other one's already been brought forth by the time they get there. Uh, now there are some also some decent sidetrack adventures that are included in here as well. Uh, and while this adventure is for levels 1 through 15, the main story begins at level 3. So if you want to do something on your own first to get your characters up to third level, you can. Uh, there's also an adventure in here for first level characters that gets them up to third so you can start the main storyline. So there are some things that you can do off to the side that um, are sort of unrelated to the point where you don't feel like you're just slogging through dungeons. But again, there's a ton and ton of dungeon crawling in this, so uh, it may feel a bit more tedious. Uh, now this adventure is decent enough and uh, you know I think that you'd have a fun time running it if you're a uh, dungeon master. Uh, my recommendation would be for DMs of intermediate skill level and higher uh, just because of the fact that there are uh, some choices that player characters can make early on that will dictate how the future events t you know unfold uh, in terms of you know which cult that they go against type of thing so um, it's best if you are fully prepared to run, you know, everything that's in this book, and I just consider this to be sort of an intermediate DM or higher. All right, up next we've got the fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons starter set adventure, The Lost Mine of Fandelver. Uh, Lost Mine of Fandelver is probably, uh, as I mentioned when I revisited my starter set review, uh, my favorite uh, starter set adventure that's ever been put out. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff in there. Um, there's also a lot of player choices that, you know, is sort of unique for starter set type adventures, which usually typically consist of just one kind of long uh, dungeon crawl that gets you from like first to third level. Uh, this ranges from levels one through five, uh, so it gets your characters up to fifth level. And I would, I really wanted to put this higher in the video. The main reason that I can't is for number one, it's inside of a starter set, so uh, more experienced dungeon masters or player groups are likely to pass on a product like this just because it is primarily geared towards beginners. Uh, the other reason is that uh, the published adventures that have been put out so far don't really capitalize well on the starter set itself. Uh, very few of them actually accommodate you as starting as third level characters. Uh, for example, Horde of the Dragon Queen, which came out immediately following the starter set like one month later, um, starts over with brand new first level characters. So it just feels like this has been completely ignored, uh, and it's only some of the more recent adventures that have actually uh, tried to accommodate this properly. Prince of the Apocalypse does mention uh, the starter set and you know what you can do if your characters have gone through that. Uh, but it still doesn't line up perfectly since, you know, the player characters will be 5th level by the end of this, 
and our third level by the time that the main adventure starts. So there's a little bit of tweaking there. Uh, if this would have been better followed up on, then I would definitely rank this higher in the list. Uh, as it stands, this is a great product for beginner, like novice DMs, up to intermediate, and even expert DMs may enjoy running this. But if you're a veteran DM, then odds are you're probably going to pass on this product because you don't feel that it's for you. So that's why it's at uh, the part of the list that it is. <clears throat> Alright, up next we have the conclusion to the Tyranny of Dragons story. This is the Rise of Tiamat. Now, I decided to split these up for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one is... Um, they are two separate books, so um, you know the odds are that you may want to buy one over the other. And the second reason is that uh, a lot of the issues that I had with the Horde of the Dragon Queen have been, uh, you know, accounted for or changed or made up for in Rise of Tiamat. So Horde of the Dragon Queen is very linear, sort of point A to point B until basically the very end, and even then it's still rather linear. Uh, Rise of Tiamat involves a lot of role-playing scenarios, a lot of player choices, uh, and a lot of uh, role-playing interaction, which I think is just really, really great. Um, so, for example, the player characters have to try to forge alliances with the Metallic Dragons, uh, with the Red Wizards of Thay, and with some other groups, as well as taking part in uh, meetings with some of the leaders of, um, you know, the City of Waterdeep, basically. Uh, as these councils go on, and as the player characters accomplish more and more, uh, the Call to the Dragon starts to become a bit uh, more concerned about their involvement, and will start sending attackers against them. Uh, each time, they actually do ramp up the severity of their attacks, to the point where uh, one of their last attacks could be quite lethal, and in all likelihood will involve at least one of the player characters dying. Now, they can be brought back by, you know, the Lord's Alliance, or... Uh, you know, wealthy, um, you know, uh, NPCs that, you know, want to, you know, see the player character succeed. Uh, one of the other great things about this adventure is the fact that uh, the player characters, when they get to the end game, actually get to choose or assign resources. And that's something that, again, is really great because it involves the player characters sort of thinking things through. Uh, so they get to assign their allies, you know, what groups they want to go where. And this is where their ability to secure other allies comes in very important. Um, so, for example, the Metallic Dragons are likely to be involved in the final battle anyway, regardless of what's going on. Um, but if the player characters are able to actually bring them to their side, then the player characters can actually control what the Metallic Dragons do, whereas if you they don't strike the Alliance, then the Metallic Dragons are just going to attack indiscriminately. So it's just things like that. You also have the ability to court the Red Wizards of Thay, which takes them from the Call to the Dragon side over to uh, you know the Heroes side, and sort of dealing with them. So there's a lot of that really great stuff in here. So again, the reason that I separated this out is because when I talked about Prince of the Apocalypse feeling not as epic as the last uh, adventure, the one that came before it, this is the book that came before it. In this, you, the player characters are uh, attempting to prevent a ritual that's going to summon Tiamat, the god, goddess of metallic dragons, or not metallic, sorry, chromatic dragons, uh, to the material plane. So, you know, the dragon queen herself ends up being the final encounter. So the player characters are facing off against a god. Now, they can do some certain things to weaken Tiamat uh, when she initially emerges. Uh, which is definitely recommended, but you're still facing off against the Queen of Dragons versus just one of the Elemental Princes. So where I kept feeling that Pr uh, Prince of the Apocalypse didn't quite feel as epic in conclusion as Rise of Tiamat did, I couldn't justify having Rise of Tiamat uh, lower than Prince of the Apocalypse for that reason. So that's why I split it up. Now again, the price point's actually pretty good on these, uh, where it is meant for, um, you know, it's part of another adventure. So if you buy the two combined adventures for the Tyranny of Dragons, you're looking at about um, uh, 60 to $70 uh, you know, US or Canadian, uh, which is not actually that far off of the current campaigns that are out there. But you also have the ability to kind of split these up. Uh, this would actually have been higher if it wasn't for the fact that it was so uh, tightly woven together with uh, Horde of the Dragon Queen. Meaning that, you know, if you don't run Horde of the Dragon Queen first, then you have to kind of fill in all the blanks yourself. 
Uh, so it's not likely that that's going to happen too much. Uh, but again, with its more emphasis on player choice, uh, player options, and role playing, uh, this is something that is actually you know shows a progression from the uh, novice dungeon masters from Horde of the Dragon Queen up to uh, you know intermediate uh, dungeon masters. Uh, for running this. So this is one that I recommend for intermediate and uh, this is an excellent product, an excellent adventure and I think it's something that you know you will enjoy. Alright, up next we have Out of the Abyss. Uh, so this is the Rage of Demons storyline. Uh, the basic premise behind this is that the, uh, the Demon Lords have been summoned to Faerun. The player characters start off as captives of uh, of the drow, so they've been captured. Uh, this does start at first level, goes up from first level to fifteenth. Uh, during their time, the player characters have to uh, escape their prison, as well as try to find means to protect themselves and defend themselves as they journey through the underdark. Uh, as they do so, they encounter you know demons and demon lords uh, that they have to try to get away from, and they can go to several different locations, including the very difficult to pronounce uh, Slubludop, or difficult to pronounce the same way twice, uh, but Slubludop, um, the Kuatoa settlement, uh, Grakenstiel, or Grakenstug, Grakelstug, uh, which is run by the, uh, the Durgar, um, you can come across a Mykonid kingdom, uh, Blindenstone, which is where the Deep Gnomes are, and eventually the player characters will make their way out of the Underdark. When they do so, however, they are quickly summoned by the King Brunor Battlehammer uh, as he requests that they return to the Underdark to find a way to put a stop to these demonic princes that are going through and basically destroying everything. Um, you know, and, and essentially doing it before they have the ability to get to the surface world. Um, the player characters will eventually make their way to Menzo Berenzin, where they have uh, a meeting with uh, not only Quinthel Benair, the leader of the, uh, the, the Drow ruling council, uh, but also a uh, Drow Archmage Lich, who comes up with a plan, basically, to get all the demon lords together in one place so that they can take each other out and the player characters can kind of sort of pick the bone, so to speak. Uh, the player characters then have to choose if they want to enact this ritual as the Lich requests inside Menzo Brenzin itself, causing untold devastation to the Drow City, or if they want to do it somewhere where other you know, lives are not going to be affected. Uh, the campaign ends with the player characters conducting their ritual, uh, bringing all the demon lords together in a titanic battle where the player character, where the players actually assume the roles of some of these demon lords, uh, which is really great. So you have the player characters assume uh, one of the demon lords, they fight it out, and uh, after a while, when a few of them have been defeated, uh, that's when Grazit, the Prince of Demons, uh, or not Grazit, sorry, yeah, Demogorgon, uh, the Prince of Demons makes his appearance, and the final, uh, basically he's designed to be the last one standing. The player characters have to face uh, off against Demogorgon. Um, so this is a pretty great uh, campaign, pretty cool adventure. Uh, my major issues with it are the fact that, um, you know, starting at first level in the Underdark, possibly without equipment, is going to be very, very difficult, especially for newer players. Uh, I've run a couple of different groups through the introductory chapter, and in general, I don't have any issues with them getting their uh, adventuring equipment back, if possible. So I've made it so that it's been relatively easy for them to get their gear back. Uh, that said, the other issue that I kind of have with this is there's a bit of linearity involved. Uh, for example, the characters are assumed to visit each of the locations that are in uh, the book, instead of... <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> instead of simply going from you know, finding one of these settlements and then finding a way to the surface from there. It's expected that they're going to go to Slubudop, to uh, Grekelstug, um, to uh, Blindenstone before they finally make their way out, um, which is something that they not necessarily want to do. And as a dungeon master, I don't necessarily want to run them through that much of the Underdark. Uh, I'd rather have them visit maybe one or two of those locations and then find their way to the surface. Uh, the other issue is that once they reach the surface, they're essentially recalled right back to the Underdark almost immediately. And I would have liked there to have been a gap, um, you know, a level gap that allows the characters to actually do some stuff on the surface 
before the demonic threat really starts to make itself known, even on the surface world, and that's when the player characters are summoned by you know King Brunor uh, to go back down into the Underdark. So I think there are ways that they could have definitely tweaked this, um, and I think as a dungeon master, you really got to gauge how long you want your players to spend in the Underdark overall. Uh, since, you know, again, it may feel like you're just kind of trapped doing just the one thing. Uh, my recommendation would be to, again, give them a level or so on the surface, let them do a couple of quests, a couple of adventures, and then make the threat of the demons known. Uh, so this adventure works great for intermediate uh, dungeon masters and above. Uh, not necessarily the easiest one to run uh, for beginner DMs, just because you're also looking at, you know, your players are probably going to be inexperienced as well, and having them without equipment in one of the most lethal settings in all of Faerun, not a great thing. So uh, again, intermediate or up, and uh, again, this runs from levels uh, 1 through 15. Alright, up next we have Curse of Strahd. So Curse of Strahd is a modern retelling of the original uh, first edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Ravenloft adventure. Uh, the player characters find their way into the misty realms of Barovia, where the only means of escape is to deal with the vampire lord Count Strahd von Zarovich. Uh, the player characters have the ability to uh, attend a fortune telling, which dictates certain elements of the campaign, where they find certain items that will be useful against uh, Strahd, what Strahd's motivations are, and um, an al you know potential ally that can uh, be used in the final confrontation. Uh, this adventure is much more of a sandbox than a lot of the previous adventures. And uh, with the random elements, uh, also with the ability to kind of explore and go to places out of order, and having, you know, Castle Ravenloft itself uh, being what it is, I recommend this for more veteran dungeon masters. Uh, if you're intermediate, you know, in terms of how much you've been running the Dungeons Dragons game, then you're probably going to be okay with this, but this is one of those adventures where you really have to be familiar with everything before you begin. Um, because the player characters can go off in any direction. You know, they can actually, upon entering uh, you know, Barovia, for the lands of Barovia for the first time, they can potentially go to one of the uh, highest level areas of the uh, of the map, and there's not much you can really do to stop them. Um, you know, you could throw some difficult encounters in their way to make it, you know, dissuade them from going there, but you don't want to guide them too much. You know, let them make their choices, let them do their things. Uh, so again, there's going to be a very high chance of lethality in this particular adventure, and uh, because of the sort of more open-ended nature, you really need to be uh, well-versed and well-familiar with everything that's in here. So, <coughs> excuse me. So I recommend this again for um, mainly for veteran dungeon masters, uh, but if you're intermediate, but you've had a, you know a couple years of running D and D under your belt, then this is going to be a great uh, adventure for you. It runs from levels one through ten, and it is sort of a more atmospheric, um, you know, horror themed uh, campaign that's going to be sort of oppressive at times and bleak and dark. So you got to be prepared for that sort of thing. It's sort of a heavy, heavy campaign. Uh, but, you know, I actually really like it. Um, I'm tr currently trying to run it for a group. We don't get together nearly as often as I would like. But I am currently trying to run this through. And uh, I really, I said, I really do like this uh, adventure. But I just can't really recommend it for, uh, for beginners or anyone that doesn't have a lot of experience sort of under their belt or comfortable running something that's as potentially open-ended as this. Alright, next up is the most recent adventure to be released. This is the Tomb of Annihilation, which is essentially an update to the Tomb of Horrors adventure uh, from way back in first edition uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, the premise behind this is sort of new, however. Uh, something referred to as the Death Curse is affecting anyone who's ever been brought back from the dead as they slowly uh, get drained of the life that's been restored to them. Uh, during this time, resurrection magic also fails, meaning that anyone that's been killed can't be brought back until this death curse is dealt with. 
As it turns out, the Death Curse is uh, the war machinations of an artifact known as the Soulmonger, which is um, you know draining the life from uh, resurrected adventurers or resurrected individuals, as well as capturing souls immediately upon death, even preventing uh, undead such as liches from having their souls returned to their phylacteries. Uh, so various groups uh, are interested in bringing about the end of this death curse. Uh, the player characters travel to the mysterious land of Cholt, which is sort of a tropical uh, jungle region. And uh, there they have to basically explore the land of Cholt until they find their way to the forbidden city of Amu. Once there, the player characters discover um, the, uh, the tomb of the nine gods, which is where the soulmonger is being uh, kept. Uh, when the player characters destroy the soulmonger, there is a chance that they run into an encounter with the Lich Acerek, who's brought this all into, into being, and that's sort of where the campaign ends. It runs for levels 1 through 11, uh, and this, where this is basically a very, very, uh, I want to say open-ended or, or non-linear as well. Even though the story points, you kind of do go from point A to point B, one of the major parts of this campaign is simply trying to find your way to the Forbidden City and find you know, its location or discover that it exists. Uh, there's a lot of exploration that can take place prior to that. Uh, the player characters have a map of Cholt at their disposal, but almost all of it, like all this part in here, is blank. Um, so it's all blanked out. So the player characters have no idea how they get to where they need to be. So they have to discover clues. There's also great potentials for them to get lost and wander completely off course altogether. So there's a lot that kind of goes into running this. I would recommend this for uh, veteran dungeon masters mainly just because of how uh, unwieldy the exploration may end up being with the characters getting lost or making sure that you're properly tracking things such as uh, water stores and things like that. Uh, intermediate DMs can probably take a, you know, a decent crack at this and I think they'll do all right but again there's a lot of stuff that you have to be aware of and it's just something that's going to be very difficult to plan out um, thoroughly because of the fact that you know the, the characters could end up getting lost uh, for several several days of travel putting them way off course making it difficult to you know be able to plan for what they encounter so um, again this is something that it's, it's a really cool adventure I love the premise um, I'm still not sold on the level range I would have liked to have seen it go into higher levels I would have liked to have seen you know Acerek play a more direct role perhaps you know even going so far as to protecting the soulmonger to prevent it from being destroyed rather than waiting until it's destroyed uh, to potentially make his entrance and the beginning also is a little bit anticlimactic in terms of you know the, the player characters are essentially told from the very beginning that they have to find the soulmonger and that it's in Schultz. so I would have liked something where they can actually discover the cause of this um, you know death curse on their own instead of being told in the introductory text all that aside, though, this does look like a really solid adventure. I'm running it now for D&D Adventurers League. Uh, so this is one that I do highly recommend, but again, this is something that's more for veteran dungeon masters uh, or intermediate DMs of, you know, higher skill or higher comfort level with uh, random elements. All right, so we are down to our final two adventures. So the first one that I want to talk about is Tales from the Yawning Portal. So this is probably my second favorite of the adventure series to be released so far. Uh, Tales from the Yawning Portal is a reprint, basically, or a series of reprints of a bunch of other uh, adventures or modules or dungeon crawls from earlier editions. Uh, so included in this are reprints of the Against the Giants, Dead and Thay, The Forge of Fury, the Hidden Shrine of Tamoshan, uh, the Sunless Citadel, the Tomb of Horrors, and White Plume Mountain. Uh, this adventure, these adventures run, I think, from uh, first up to fifteenth uh, level, with uh, Tomb of Horrors being the highest level uh, adventure in here. So let's see here. It starts. It's recommended for. Uh, running the adventure. All right, I don't see the actual uh, level range presented here. So, uh, but I think it's for like 13th to 15th level characters. 
if I recall, because the uh, the against the giants is starts at 11th level. So you get quite a few levels out of this. Now this is not meant to be uh, interconnected. So even though the levels do line up, so you can go from one to the other, there's no actual storyline that connects them all. So the, what this is best used for is to pull some of these dungeons out of the book and into your own campaigns. Or if there's a gap in between things you could certainly use it to, to run run players through. So, for example, I ran some of the Citadel for D&D Adventurers League, which goes from levels 1 through 3. So if you're looking to run something like, say, Prince of the Apocalypse or Curse of Strahd, um, you could run some of the Citadel first and then run that campaign. Uh, you could also run some stuff, you know, uh, in between if there's, you know, gaps, like if you'd run out of the Abyss and you bring the characters back before the adventure uh, intends, you could pull one of the dungeons out for the level that they're at, have them explore that, and then potentially go back. So this is really great for any dungeon master. Um, Sun of the Citadel is for first level characters, and it was sort of an introductory adventure for the third edition role-playing game. So uh, if you're a novice DM, you're going to get some use out of this, and if you're a uh, veteran DM, you're going to get some use out of this. So this is an adventure that I consider to be for, or this is a product that I consider to be useful for any level of experience in terms of DMing games. Uh, the reason that this isn't number one overall is just the fact that they are just a series of um, non-connected uh, dungeon crawls. I mean, you can sort of weave something through where they learn about, you know, the existence of the next dungeon uh, in the previous one, and the first two adventures actually being uh, Son of the Citadel and Forge of Fury were actually run one after the other back in third edition, so there's a little bit of connectedness, but it's not the strongest in the world. Um, the uh, other thing is that the Awning Portal itself plays almost no role in this adventure, or in this adventure book. It's uh, the details of the Awning Portal itself is limited to, I think, about a page and a half of text. And I don't even think there's a, uh, a map of it, to be honest, uh, come to think of it. When I uh, did my initial review, it just didn't seem like there was... Yeah, there's not even a map of the uh, of the Awning Portal itself. And the Awning Portal is more synonymous with the entrance to Undermountain, which none of these adventures take place in. So the title doesn't really line up with what's in the book. Uh, but this is a great product uh, for any dungeon master. And, uh, you know, even if you're running your own homebrewed campaigns and you're running adventures of your own design, you may eventually come across a gap in, in level progression, or you may eventually get sort of a little bit burned out on trying to design adventures. And this is perfect for that because you can take a break, run something out of the book, and then go right back to your homegrown storylines. So I absolutely love this product, and uh, that's why I've got it ranked at number two. Uh, I consider putting it at number one, but again, where it's not an actual uh, adventure that you run through from beginning to end, um, and where it's all dungeon crawls, it's something that is better used uh, to pull and kind of pull adventures out and plug them into existing games. So that's why it's at number two. And at number one, my favorite of all the adventures that have been released so far is Storm King's Thunder. So Storm King's Thunder is for player characters levels 1 through 10. Uh, the main story itself actually starts at level 5. Uh, essentially, uh, the god of giants has become um, upset that his you know, creations have fallen into essentially complacency. Uh, even going so far as to aiding the call to the dragon in Horde of the Dragon Queen, even though dragons are giants' natural enemies. So the god of, uh, of giants destroys something called the Ordning, which is sort of the pecking order for... Uh, the giant races determine which one is the most powerful and which ones would be considered the least powerful. Uh, as this happens, you know, the god instructs the giants to essentially create a new ordning to, you know, um, basically try to establish their dominance uh, for giant kind. And as this happens, it's going to wreak havoc for this, you know, civilized folk or the small folk. Uh, so the player characters go through, and um, there's actually a lot of choices and options that take place in this adventure. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, material that's in here that you're not actually going to end up using when you run the campaign. Uh, essentially, the player characters start in a settlement that's being attacked, and it's one of three settlements that they could possibly be in. Once they thwart the attack, they can take on some side quests from some of the uh, helpful NPCs that um, were able to aid them during the attack. 
and uh, kind of go about their business. Uh, eventually, they learn that, you know, again, things are getting, you know, really bad as far as, you know, the Giants are concerned, and they want to find a way to fix this. In order to do so, they have to go to a location that's sacred to giant kind in order to speak with this divine oracle. Uh, the oracle will not do anything for them, however, until they retrieve a relic that's important to giant kind. So there's many different potential relics that the player characters can go after, meaning that, again, there's a lot of choice there. Uh, once the player characters do that, they have to get an item that will allow them to enter uh, the Storm Giant stronghold of Maelstrom. In order to do that, they have to get a... one of these items are being carried by each of the giant chieftains uh, for hill giants, stone giants, fire giants, and uh, frost giants. So the characters choose which of those groups to pursue, and once they, you know, choose one of those four groups, uh, they, you know, confront and hopefully defeat the giant chieftain, get the item that they need, and then they make their way to Maelstrom where they try to uh, smooth things over uh, with the storm giants to the point where they discover the true cause of what's, you know, led to all these things happening, including the disappearance of the storm giant king. Um, so the player characters have the ability to rescue the storm giant king and eventually uh, encounter the sort of one of the, the masterminds behind all the bad things that have happened so far, uh, the blue dragon uh, Imrith. And once they, you know, encounter the dragon and defeat it, that's sort of the end of the of the adventure. So the reason that I love this one so much is just the amount of variety uh, that the player characters can can experience when going through this. It's possible to have multiple groups uh, start this at the same time and have wholly different experiences um, before they reach Maelstrom, um, which is sort of one of the the few places where, which is the the point where the adventure paths kind of all merge into one. But leading up to that point, there's uh, any manner of different things that the player characters could have done. They can be in a different region when the attacks take place. They may pursue one of the different giant relics. Uh, they may pursue one of the different chieftains. So there's a lot of variety in this, in this book. You could even run this for multiple groups, and up until the point where they reach Maelstrom, have wholly different experiences for each group that you run this through. So giving player characters a great deal of choice in, uh, in how they go through the adventure is one of the reasons that I really absolutely love this. Uh, now this is uh, for levels like I, th I think I said earlier 1 through 10 and I honestly think that DMs of any level of skill can run this adventure. Uh, now I know there's a lot of open-ended uh, sections but they're done sort of in segments so uh, for example if you know the you as the DM you can decide which location the player characters start in when the attack happens. Then, you know, after the attack, you know which NPCs have survived, you know which NPC side quests that the player characters may want to go on. Uh, once that happens, you know, you take them to um, the, you know, to meet with the Oracle, or they learn that they need to find a relic of um, a giant kind in order to gain an audience with, uh, with the Oracle. So you can end a session uh, by presenting the different choices that the player characters can can go through and uh, once they make their decision and the adventure for that night read up on that section and then you know kinda go through it on the next session uh, once the player characters decide or do that you know, they have to decide which of the giant chieftains they want to go after and it's pretty straightforward to run each of those individual sections so you just go to that chapter and run the events through there and then once they do that and they reach Maelstrom everything's kind of you know uh, simple and straightforward from that point on so this is something that I really think can be done for uh, multiple groups of varying experience I even think that novice dungeon masters running the introductory chapter uh, will be comfortable uh, with running you know the more advanced stuff by the time that they get there so this is like I said my personal favorite of the pre-release campaign so far and uh, this is one I haven't attempted to run this one yet but it's the adventure that I'm looking the most forward to starting so there you go that's sort of my order of um, preference for each of these adventures so I hope you found this video useful and again I know when it comes to putting things in lists or listing them off by personal preference it may upset some people I'm sure there are individuals out there who absolutely loved Horde of the Dragon Queen and would consider it to be their favorite and you're not wrong. 
Uh, if you loved that adventure and if you had a great time playing it, that's the most important thing. I, I ran Horde of the Dragon Queen for the first few uh, chapters, and I enjoyed doing it. I had to make some changes so I would enjoy doing it, but I did enjoy running it. And there are going to be people out there that are absolutely going to have a blast of a time running through that adventure. So again, just because I ranked them lower than where you may have, doesn't mean that I think they're bad. I think all of these adventures are actually, you know, really good and have something to offer. It's just there are certain ones that I'm more interested in running than others. So again, thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this series of Dungeons & Dragons Buyer's Guide videos. And, um, you know, let me know what you know, your personal preferences are, what your favorite of these adventures have been. And if you've actually run through any of these, let me know some of your stories. Because I'd be interested to hear how some of these events have played out for you guys. So again, thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you next time.